He paid for all of the sins, for all of the people, for all of time. You know, it doesn't take a double doctoral or a master's work. I'm not poking fun at anybody. Be who God created you to be, please. It always boils down to our relationship with Jesus. That it, that relationship affects everything in our lives. God chose Israel. Our founding fathers chose God. Be a doer of the word. Because faith without works is dead, for real. That's religion, that's knowledge, that's intellect. You need to go out there and engage with your world and own your liberty. Well, Pastor Bob was apologizing for taking so long, but really all I need to do is summarize what's been said from the beginning today. Because seriously, I think every point that I've got has been touched on in one way or another. So I don't know about you, but I'm just celebrating that we're hearing from the Holy Spirit. And I'm celebrating that he has one message, one clear message, and he wants you to get it. So I'm not big on titles, but Mitchell's always asking me for titles, so I, I have a title for this message, but I couldn't decide between two, so I put them together. <laughs> so I'm calling this, I don't know what he'll put on the video, but I'm calling this Matters of the Heart, or The Heart Matters. Hmm, hmm, thank you. <laughs> Make a note over here on that. Many of you have heard my teaching on spirit, soul, and body. And I teach a lot on spirit, soul, and body because spirit, soul, and body is one of the main things that unlocked the scriptures for me. It was a key for me. If you're just reading it in your mind and you don't understand that you are a spirit, you have a soul, and you live in a body, you're missing a lot of what the Bible's talking about because it's talking about your body at times, it's talking about your soul at times, it's talking about your spirit at times. But I'm talking about the heart today. So what's, what's the heart? Well, it's obviously not the blood pump because this isn't a medical seminar. We're not gonna talk about that. And a lot of teachings mix heart and spirit together, which is okay. I'm good with that, but I want to define, kind of explain what I'm thinking about when I'm talking about the heart today. Um, because you've heard it up here. Pastor Bob said it a lot. I know I've said it, and I'm sure Steve said it a lot. Christianity, serving God, it's all about the heart. Have you heard that? It is. It's all about the heart. And I want to clarify because I have taught spirit, soul, and body, and I've been dogmatic, and I don't apologize for being dogmatic about the fact that we are created in God's image, God is spirit, we are spirit, and that's perfect once we're born again. But I realized not too long ago that if you just dwell on that dogmatic part, then people are wondering, oh, am I in the spirit now? Oh, no, no, I'm in the flesh. And oh, maybe I'm in, which way am I going to go? And I've even talked to people and heard them say, well, I was in the spirit. And that confused me, to, oh, my goodness, 30 years ago. I had a lady testify in a, in a service that I was attending. And she said, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. And I thought, how do you get into the spirit? What is that? I don't know what she's talking about. So when I talk about heart, it is, does affect the spirit. But I want you to think when I say heart today about the core of a matter. Not your flesh heart, not just your spirit, but that combination of your spirit and your soul that works together and it is the core of your being it's the foundation of your belief it is who you are the heart so we're going to talk about matters of the heart or the heart matters you okay with that yeah. now I changed my Bible reading this year. 
I know a lot of you are reading through the Bible, and I'm using the same guide as I used last year, but I decided I want to focus more on the New Testament. <coughs> so I'm just doing daily reading, not as the guide says, but I'm just following the order. Um, and I'm reading two or three chapters, depending on my time or depending on how much the Lord grabs me and wants me to pay attention to something. And I've just been going through the Gospels. My intention is to read the New Testament two or three times this year, not just to read it, because I could read it six, eight, ten times if I really just read through it. But I want to study it. I want to examine it. I want to meditate on things. I want to, what's the word, ruminate. I want to ruminate on it. I like that, ruminating in the word. And just see what God's got. And for the last two or three weeks, I've been doing pretty good. I started with John, got some beautiful stuff out of John. I've got notes that someday I'll get to share. Um, and then Matthew and Mark, and I'm in Luke now. And for the last three weeks, I've been stuck in chapter 16, 17, and 18. Now, it's no coincidence that he brings up chapter 12 because it's all in that same area. <laughs> it's the Holy Spirit. But I have just been reading chapters 14 to chapter 18 is primarily parables. And I don't know about you, but I have a tendency to just read over stuff and keep it going. And especially some of these parables I heard when I was a kid. And so, yeah, yeah, I heard that. I know all about that. No, 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 no. If you don't stop, if you don't take time and purposefully meditate and hear what the Spirit is saying, you're not going to get what God wants you to get. Now, I've picked out, I don't know, three or four parables that to me, they tie together. And there's one common theme. And actually, there's one common theme in all of them. And I don't have time to dig in. You'll notice I teach differently than Pastor Steve. Bob teaches differently than Pastor Steve, which is a good thing. But there's one thing I want to point out. What I got in three or four weeks of studying and meditating and note taking, I'm going to try to give you in the next 60 minutes. <laughs> so I'm not going to go too deep. Is that OK with you? Now, Pastor Steve, when he announces a series, and he can do 20-some Sundays on it, or as Pastor Ryan says, take a series and go for seven years, um, you could take every word and divide it and look underneath it and just get squeeze every little bit out of it. I can't do that with this. But I do want to get this common theme that's been on my heart there's that word hard again. You're going to hear it a lot. But in this three or four weeks, I've seen things in the parables that I've never seen before or that I just assumed were there. I'll give you an example, like the Christmas story. Unless you've studied the Christmas story, the nativity, the virgin, all of that, most of your Christmas story is made up from Hallmark cards, which is not necessarily Bible. I grew up in a mainline church, and I'm not saying anything bad about the mainlines. I learned a lot of Bible in the mainline. But I didn't learn a lot about the Spirit. I didn't learn about a lot about the life in the Word. I didn't learn a lot of things, but oh, I had the Bible stories down pat. So my problem at, at my age is a lot of times I'll just sit, I'll read it and say, yep, yeah, I've been studying that all my life. You gotta slow down, slow down. The world is speeding up, but how many know that everything that the world does is opposite the kingdom? A yeah. Little bit of advice, slow down and listen to what the Spirit is saying. Because the Spirit, I don't want to say that. I was going to say that the Spirit's talking more than ever, but he doesn't change. He's always been talking. 
But we're reaching a day and an age where it behooves us to hear what the Spirit is saying. It's a matter of life and death. Might not like it being put that bluntly, but it's the truth. It's a matter of life and death. The first parable I want to talk about is in Luke 18. If I could see verse 9, please hope. It's about the Pharisee and the tax collector. How many know that parable? Got it, got it down pat, right? Pharisee, he's up there bragging on what he's doing. I had always seen him lording it over everybody else. And there are places in scripture where it says the Pharisees stood on the street corners and made a show of their giving and all of that. But this parable, I saw something that really caught my eye. It says he spoke or he spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Now that fits a Pharisee to a T. They were self-righteous. They had the law. They had studied the law, but they had also interpreted the law, interpreted the law to their benefit. They manipulated the law to make it easier to follow. And they thought they were good because of who they were. They thought they had a righteousness, but it was not a righteousness of God. It was all self-righteousness. Verse 9, or 10, please. This is two men went up to the temple to pray. The one, a Pharisee, the other, a publican. Publican, tax collector. That's a good enough definition, probably. Tax collector. Y'all got a mental image? I, I knew an IRS agent one time. He's a very nice man, but his job. Whew. So we get this mental image of a tax collector. They're scoundrels. They're, they're taking more than their fair share. They're getting rich off the backs of people. So we got the Pharisee who's self-righteous and a publican. And in verse 11, it says, the Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. And when I was reading that, I did a head jerk. It's like, what? He wasn't praying out loud. Do you see that there or not? Or am I the only one? He prayed with himself. God, I thank thee. I thank thee that I am not as other men are. And then he gives a list, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even this publican. He was reasoning with God. He was praying. And I'm saying he was praying silently. Verse 12. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. The last verse, he was being judgmental. This verse, he's got both feet smack dab in the law. So he's self-righteous, legal. We define, Bob and I were up here for questions and answers. We define legal. Everybody's okay with what legalism is. Following the law to a T. So this Pharisee, he's praying silently to God. He's judging others in his prayer. And he's being legalistic in the law. Verse 13, and the publican, standing afar off, would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Jesus has given us this parable. And he's explaining how the Father hears our prayers. The publican was praying to himself, but God knew his heart. There is no question about it. He knew his heart. The publican, the tax collector, he was making a show of it, but it was in his 
total helplessness. And it wasn't the making the show of it that got God's attention. It was the humility of it. It was the fact that I can't do this myself. So you got the Pharisees saying, I can do this. I got it covered. I know the law. And I am heads above the rest of them. And the publican says, nothing I can do. A lot of you have heard my testimony, and I'm not going to take time for my testimony. But when I was in Vietnam, struggling with malaria, I prayed for a week to be healed. Didn't get an answer. Because I just wanted to feel better. So then I, maybe I got it backwards. It was only 52 years ago. Um, <laughs> but anyway, I prayed another week. I think this was the first week. I said, Lord, make me sicker because I was so sick, but I wasn't sick enough to get dusted off the front line. So I prayed to get sick. That's what it was. I prayed for a week and I didn't get sicker. Military says 104 temperature, you get dusted off. I had 103.8, 103.7, 103.9 1 one day. Woohoo, we're going to go. The medic, I kept going to the medic. Take my temp, doc. Take my temp, doc. This guy was a conscientious objector. You know what a conscientious object objector is? They don't kill people. Doc Grody, Grotolution, nice German name. Doc Grody, we called him lovingly. He says, Harvey, if you ask me to take your temperature one more time, I'm going to kill you. <laughs> You're a conscientious objector. So anyway, that prayer didn't work. Then I prayed to be healed. Another week, nothing, absolutely nothing, because my prayer was wrong. It's just selfish. I just wanted to feel better. And I wasn't too much different than that publican when I finally said, God, I don't know how to pray. But I do know one thing. I know that you gave me a free will. And I only want to do one will, thing with my free will. And that is to make your will my will. That fast, I felt a hug from behind, a literal hug. And I was afraid to look around. God healed me of malaria. God set me free. I got a super dose of the love of God just that fast. Because it's a matter of the heart. It's the heart. It's not the prayer. It's not the words. It's the condition of the heart. That publican was in error on many, many items. But I was reminded while I was studying that, 2 Corinthians 10, 12, which you don't have, but don't worry, Hope. I'm just going to read it real quick. Um, Andrew Womack uh, quotes this an awful lot. It says, for we dare not make ourselves of the number or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves, but they, me but they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves, are you following that? Are not wise. So, beloved, if you're comparing yourself to others, that's not wise. That's not wise. It's the Bible. That's not wise. You see, it's a condition of the heart. The Pharisee was proud and self-righteous, and the tax collector was humble, acknowledging his helplessness. And then I went over to Luke 16, and I'm not going to teach on this parable, but I'm only going to mention it because it leads right up to where I want to go in the next parable or in the next section. But... Um, in Luke 16, verses 1 through 13, which you also don't have hope, that's, if you remember, the rich man, and he had a manager, and he found out that the manager wasn't doing his job, and he was going to let him go. And so the manager, he thought, what can I do? I don't want to dig ditches. I'm too proud to beg. I got to do something for me for the future. So he goes to the creditors and he adjusts the bill. 
Of course, they're happy. And now he's got people indebted to him. And I've struggled with this, and I'm not teaching on it for two reasons. One, it takes too long. I think I got a grasp on it, but I'm not even going to try to do it in this time frame. But see, the rich man commended the dishonest manager for at least thinking ahead and using the world's riches to make a better future for himself. Oh, there's silence in here. And that silence is deafening. <laughs> One of the takeaways I got from that is it's okay to use the world system as long as you're using it for the other, for the kingdom gain. You ever heard the, ever heard the phrase, so spiritually minded that they're no earthly good? Yeah. That's not a good place to be. Yes, it's all a matter of the heart, but if, if you can't use the worldly system, first place, you want to get real basic, unless the Lord brings the food by a raven, you're going to starve because the world system's got the food. Am I right? We got to use it. We got to use it wisely, but we've got to use it. But that's the... That's just a quick overview of that parable. It's the manager commends the steward's shrewdness. And that leads right into, and that's why I wanted to bring that up, it leads right into faithfulness. Faithfulness. In Luke 16, verse 10, it says that he that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. And he that is unjust in the least is unjust also in much. Verse 11, If therefore ye have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? Now we're back to that unrighteous mammon. We're back to the world system. We live in a fallen world. We cannot divorce ourselves from the fallen world. If we're going to function and be any good, I mean, there's people in history that have just taken what they needed and gone to the hills and found a cave. Wait for the Lord's return. How's that working for them? It won't work for us. We're to occupy until he comes. We got a job to do. The harvest is ripe. There aren't that many workers. Beloved, we got work to do. And God's going to give us everything and everybody we need to do it. That's a promise. Hallelujah. If therefore you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who, mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches, the riches of the kingdom. And if you have not been faithful in that which is another man's, who shall give you that which is your own? And I don't really, I, don't, I wish I didn't have to, but I'll point it out. There's people in this room who have not been faithful with little. There are people in this room who have not been faithful with other people's stuff. I'm not looking at anybody in particular. I'm just moving my head around because I don't know your story, but you know, and the Lord knows, and that's important. We talk about the Lord knows our every thought, but do we really believe it? Do we really consider it? When we take that, cop that attitude, or when we pop off to somebody, I thought I was making a joke a week ago. I had to apologize to my sister and make sure she had no offense. <laughs> you gotta be, we gotta guard our hearts. We gotta guard our words. The time is short. 
I'm going to get to that a little bit later. I got time. So verses 10, 11, and 12 talking about faithfulness goes right into verse 13. It says, no servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. As I was meditating on that, I realized, well, I, I just dug down deeper. The context of this is money, right? Are we in agreement on that? Yeah. Context is money. But this is not limited to money. Right. You cannot serve two masters. Pastor Steve talked about that a while back, not too long ago. It's about your heart. Is your heart divided? God wants 100% of your heart, the core of you, your everything. You may be satisfied thinking you're doing good with 99% of your heart to God and 1% to whatever. You fill in the blank. That's not God's best. And that 1% will knock you out of so many blessings, it'll make your head spin. We learned in men's group yesterday. Where was that? In Peter? Second Peter? First Peter? Talking about men. How many men we got in here? I mean men. Real men. <laughs> Some people are like, <laughs> Ooh, don't let me go there. <laughs> I purpose to be careful today and not do anything to put YouTube in jeopardy or beloved church in jeopardy with YouTube or however you want to say it. So I'm going to behave. But we learned that men, if you're not treating your wife with honor and respect, that, you got your seatbelt on? That will hinder your prayers. It doesn't say prayers for your wife. It says your prayers. You don't treat your wife right, you're blocking your prayers to heaven. Does that sound harsh? It's Bible. It's Bible. It's not me. It's Bible. Every prayer you think you're raising up to God, if you're not treating your wife the way that God wants you to treat her as a precious gem and jewel that he gave to you, your prayers are hindered. Because a, a divided heart isn't going to cut it, especially in this day and age. We say things from the pulpit. I've said them. Pastor Bob said them. Pastor C said them. We got to guard our hearts. And God wants all of our heart. Am I making myself clear? I hope so. March 19th, two weeks ago, right? Does anybody remember what word went forth? Pastor Steve got off the drums, talked about forgiveness, right? Yeah. yeah, that was just two weeks ago. That was a word from God. That was the Lord speaking through our pastor. And everybody that was here that day had an opportunity to do whatever it took to make your heart right in regards to other people, if there was any ought, or if you needed forgiveness, or wanted to give forgiveness, you had an opportunity. I didn't see everybody doing it. So I'm assuming that not every, that there was a certain amount that are okay with God. But I'm bringing it up because we can't serve two masters. We can't serve God with only part of our heart. We have to get our hearts healed. We have to get our heart solid with God. And in this day and age, I cannot emphasize it enough. 
because we are in a day like nobody has ever seen. And I'm not gonna go off on the political situation for maybe another 15 minutes. Because <laughs> that's coming, it's in my notes, but uh, <laughs> just give you an idea what's coming. But see, it's a matter of the heart. It's a matter of the heart. And there's nothing that I can preach, there's nothing that Pastor Bob can preach, there's nothing that anybody can say to you that'll make that right. The only way you're gonna get your heart right is spend time with the Father. Now this subject, yes, it has been heavy on my heart. And I'm not playing games with the word. I mean, God's been dealing with my heart. Remember at Christmas time, I testified that the Lord really gave me something that healed my heart in regard to my wife going home early. And I thought I had it healed. I really thought I was doing good after Christmas. I mean, grief, grief is a stinking, no, it's terrible. Um, some people handle it better than others. I have not handled it the best. And at the risk of being a Pharisee and judging myself with others, I've handled it better than some, but not as good as I could have. But I thought Christmas, I thought, man, I'm really happy. God, thank you for that healing. And then I testified again that when I was in Kenya, the Lord healed something in my heart that I didn't even know needed healing. And he set me free. And you think, well, how did you know it? I mean, if you had something wrong on your body, like a, like a, like a tumor or something, and you got healed of it and it fell off, you'd say, oh, oh, hallelujah, I'm healed. This was in my heart. But I knew that I knew that I knew there was not a bit of doubt. And God spoke to me. He said, that part of you that you thought was dead, I am restoring. I'm giving it new life. You wonder why I've been walking around a little, woo -hoo. I'm still dealing with it. That was such a monumental healing in my heart. And if there's anybody in this room from hearing my testimony that could reach that same place in your heart, I pray that for you. Because that's what God wants for you. I'd be agreeing with God when I prayed that. Because he wants your whole heart. Divided hearts don't count in this battle. And it's going to get worse before it gets better. But it will get better. Just as a reference to that uh, March 19th word that is still in the air. You realize when a word goes out, it stays. That word for beloved is hovering. I'll even go so far as to say that if the Lord lays on your heart right now, while I'm speaking, I give you permission to get up and take care of it whatever that looks like. Because that word is not two weeks old. That word is as fresh as the day that it went forward. Amen. And maybe you've been stuttering and stammering around and thinking all the reasons why you shouldn't go to that person. And if the Lord touches you during this service, I don't care about order. I don't care about anything. Get up, get it dealt with. Ooh. That wasn't in my notes. <laughs> Hallelujah. We're talking about matters of the heart. No division. Not just a little bit of division. No division. Hallelujah. So I read verse 13, and I'll read it again. No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Do you remember Pastor Steve? And I'm sure Pastor Bob's done it too, but we need to read the Bible as it was written. Didn't have chapters and verse. Didn't have paragraph headings. You just read. And I read 13 a couple times because 13 is the setup for verse 14. Now, I do most of my studying in the uh, Berean Study Bible, the BSB. 
And right between verse 13 and verse 14, it says, the law and the prophets. And we have a tendency, I knew, I do, and I'm sure you do too, that, okay, 13's ended, now we go to 14, that's a new thought. No, 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 these tie together. Jesus is teaching on faithfulness. He's teaching on a divided heart, having two masters, and how you cannot do it. And then in verse 14, he says, And the Pharisees also, who were covetous, heard all these things, and they derided him. Jesus is talking to the multitude. I don't know how many thousand were there. But there was a group of Pharisees, and there, were, there was everything. Unbelievers, believers, disciples. Jesus had more than 12 disciples, you know. We got 12 in the inner core, the staff. But there were hundreds, thousands of disciples in his three and a half years of ministry. They were all there. And then Jesus talks about serving two masters. And he calls out the Pharisees in the crowd. And the Pharisees also, who were covetous. BSB says, who were lovers of money. That's why they tie together. Because Jesus builds that faithfulness idea up. And then he talks about two masters. You can't love money and love God. And then, oh yeah, by the way, Pharisees, talking to you. They heard all these things and they derided him. They didn't like it. They didn't like it. I don't know what all their derision involved. We can only speculate. Maybe Pastor Bob with his... Um, his BLT and his the, um, comic book way of interpreting the Bible, maybe he could give us an example of derision. <laughs> He's looking it up right now. He's looking it up. <laughs> it wasn't good, I'll tell you that. But like I said, I'm not doing a series, so I can't examine every word for you. You want to know what derision means? Do what Bob's doing. Look it up. That's your homework. And he said unto them. Now, you could read that and say he said to the crowd he was talking to. But I put in parentheses here to remind myself. I believe he said this to the Pharisees. He knew their hearts. He knew who they were. He could go, right, you're a Pharisee, you're a Pharisee. Oh, you're over there, you're a Pharisee. Yep, yep. Because it's a matter of the heart. And he said unto them, the Pharisees. Yea, are they which justify yourselves before men. But God knoweth your hearts. There it is again. I'm drilling down on the fact that God knows your heart. You may think you're getting away with something. You aren't. You aren't. I don't know how to say it more clearly. You aren't getting away with anything. I don't care if you do it in your bedroom with the lights out. You aren't getting away with it because God knows your heart. Did I make myself clear? But God knoweth your hearts. For that which is highly esteemed among men is abomination in the sight of God. I was guilty for years just read through those. And man, these last three, four weeks, just sitting there, just letting the Holy Spirit just download. I had one morning, I told Pastor Steve about it. I don't know if I have told anybody else. I've got this rocking chair. It's an antique wood rocking chair that I bought for my bride on our first anniversary. Well, that was a few years ago because we were married almost 51 years. I bought it at an auction in Mendota, Illinois for $13. And it was old when we bought it. And it's 50 plus years older now. Those of you in the Grace Group, you know what I'm talking about because that's where, that's my seat in Grace Group. I sit in that chair for Grace Group and I sit in that chair in the morning. When I get up, I have communion and then I spend time with the Lord. 
And I'm going to tell you this, not to, not to brag on myself or flaunt anything, I'm just telling you, it keeps getting better and better and better. I have been doing this for over a year now, since I've been single for over a year now. Um, and there's some mornings where it's like, okay, I did my thing, I sat down, I read the Bible. But honestly, did I feel, did I feel, that's a, that's a word I'm not supposed to use, but did I sense the presence of God? There's days I didn't. But then there's other days where I get in the word and the Lord would just start ministering things. And it's like, oh, I could just bask in this. And sometimes I've been there for like two, three hours and it's beautiful. You say, well, yeah, you don't have to go to work. Well, yeah, I am blessed. I am blessed. I've worked hard all my life. God gave us a sabbatical. And he hasn't told me to quit being on a sabbatical yet. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Amen. So I'm blessed to have a part-time position here at Beloved Church. I write my own hours. Just as long as I get my work done, everybody's happy. So if I want to spend three hours with the Lord, I can do it. Amen. But there was one Sunday morning that I... This, I'll never forget this. Had my communion. When I, oh, I didn't mention it. I can make a cup of coffee, too. After communion, I make coffee. So I took my coffee over to my prayer chair. And the moment I sat down, I sensed the Lord. And it was like he said, where you been? I'm waiting for you. That was glorious. That was glorious. And I only tell you that because God's no respecter of persons. He didn't do that because I'm a pastor on staff at Beloved Church. He didn't do that because I'm diligent to study my Bible, because there are people that are more diligent to study my Bible, their Bible, not my Bible, their Bible, <laughs> than I am. So it isn't about the works. Can you guess what it's about? The heart. It's all about the heart. It's all about the heart. I can't emphasize it enough because that's the main emphasis of what I'm talking about. It's all about the heart. And anything else, verse 15, that we esteem among men, don't forget, is abomination. It's detestable to God. And you may be thinking, well, how do I function in the world? God knows you're in the world. God knows the world is fallen. God knows you've got to rub up against the world to exist here. Yes, our spirit's perfect. Our soul's in process. Our mind's in process. We're renewing our hearts. There's that heart again. Romans 12, 2, we're renewing our hearts. It's a process. The Bible tells us to work out our own salvation. It's a process. But where's your focus? Where is your focus? If you love anything equal to or greater than God, you're in a bad position. I would be in a bad position too. All of us would be in bad positions because God wants your whole heart. He wants an undivided heart. Um, oh, do I tell you? time. Real quickly. Peggy had a really hard time with... Um, with grief after our son died. And uh, she ended up getting a Christian counselor. And this counselor didn't use the counseling of the world. <sighs> this counselor even never really even said anything to Peggy other than, what's on your heart? They would pray together and just say, what's God telling you? And Peggy would talk. And in that process of the time span that Peggy talked with this counselor, her name was Jamie, about half of it, she really got over our son's death. But as she probed and let the Holy Spirit bring things up, she cleaned up her whole childhood, which was not pretty. She came from a dysfunctional family. Um, she had buried so many things in her heart that were affecting her, even up till the day she passed away. And I know that you people too, and I do too, because that's why God's still healing my heart. I'm not, I'm not standing and lording it over you. I'm one of you. I don't want any question there. We all have areas in our heart that need exposure. They need to be dealt with. 
They need healed. And our God wants to do it. He is ever present to do it. I love the songs we sing. There's so many of them that talk about rushing and running and hustling. I say, slow down. You want to hear from God? Slow down just a little bit. Take the edge off. And I know our schedules are crazy. Even my schedule on sabbatical is crazy. And I don't have to really answer to anybody but the Lord. But it gets hectic. But for your own health, for your own peace, for your own heart, slow down and say, Lord, what do you got for me? He's not going to do it all at once. You couldn't stand the shock. But he will, step by step, because it's a process. So then moving right along, because I really want to get to the end. Next one I want to talk about is Jesus blessing the little children. Luke 18, 15. And they brought unto him also infants, that they would touch them. But when his disciples saw it, they rebuked them. And I've always pictured that scene with like... When our kids go line up behind Miss Jess or whoever's holding the sign, that's what I see, kids running to Jesus. But I did do a little digging because I was curious because there was a couple different words here. Luke 18, 15, it says, they brought unto him also infants. That's King James. And it's also infants in BSB and several others. That word in the Greek is brephos. Brephos, and it means infants, newborns, are you ready for this? Unborn. Amen. Anybody says that's not a baby in the womb? <laughs> they were bringing their babies in the womb to Jesus. Amen. What a way to start a life. <laughs> But Jesus called unto them and said, Suffer the little children to come unto me, and forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of God. That word little children, the children there in verse 16 is paedion, means a young child, a little child, an infant, or a little one. And so in those two verses, we have everything from an unborn child to the little ones. And I understand that there's a development, and I understand that kids, when they're born, they are totally innocent. They're selfish, but they're totally innocent. They haven't formed any ideas or opinions. They just know that when they're wet, they're wet. When they're hungry, they're hungry. And they know that if they let somebody know about it, it'll get taken care of. To that degree, they're selfish. But their hearts are pure. Their hearts are undefiled. And that's, I believe, what the Holy Spirit is pointing out here. We need to come to the kingdom like a little child. We got to get rid of all this baggage that's in our hearts. And it's not something we do by ourselves. And it's not something you pay a psychiatrist or a psychologist or whatever. I don't know how much they go for today. I'd be afraid to ask. I don't want to. That's not what we're talking. We're talking about getting with the Father. Letting the Holy Spirit do a work in you. Letting the Holy Spirit heal you in areas that you may not even know are broken. In this day and age, it is vital. If you're going to survive what's to come, you need to get it right. I need to get it right. We need to get it right, individually and corporately. That's why, did I mention that that for exhortation and word on the 19th to forgive is still active? It's still hovering around here. It's still hovering around here, and it is a word for now. So a little child is innocent, trusting, naive, accepting, and dependent. We need to go to God in an innocence, trusting him 
in his word. We need to be naive. Whatever you say, Lord. Okay. Don't worry about what I thought before or what happened the other day. I'm just coming to you on open slate, accepting whatever the Holy Spirit says, accept it. It's the word. And dependent. The Lord is my shepherd. Sheep depend on shepherds. I've never read, the st read a story about a actual animal, sheep, being rebellious. They're followers. That's their nature. They're followers. Oh, well, they may wander a little bit, but rebellion's not in them. Now, maybe a goat? Yeah. That's why Jesus talks about sheep and goats. But sheep are followers. We need to be followers. See, it's a matter of the heart. Oh, this is going to work out perfect. That clock is cooperating. So then we move to Luke 17. And my subtitle or paragraph title says, The Coming of the Kingdom. I told you we were going to get to it. We're coming into a new age, saints. Amen. Now, maybe you've not bought into all that's going on. Maybe you've just, well, I'm spiritual. I don't watch the news. What's going to happen is going to happen. Well, you're right. What's going to happen is going to happen. But get on board. Wake up. They don't call it the Great Awakening for nothing. And it's happening all over. I talked to a man the other night. Um, two nights ago, he called me. He works with the uh, Native Indians up in um, northern Minnesota, North Dakota. He just helped another ministry with a, he wouldn't call it a revival. He said it was not a revival. It was more of an awakening. And on a Native American reservation, hmm, they had a weekend meeting, 2,500 in attendance and over 200 decisions for Christ. Amen. That's power. Yes. It's happening. Mm -hmm. You've all heard of Asbury. Yeah. And there's a whole list that goes <laughs> under that name because it's happening everywhere. But I was curious what the Lord was saying in Luke, because there's a whole section here on, on these days that we are entering into. And in Luke 17, 20, it says, And when he was demanded of the Pharisees when the kingdom of God should come, he answered them and said, The kingdom of God cometh not with observation. Neither shall I say, verse 21, Lo, here, or lo, there, for behold, the kingdom of God is within you. It's that heart we've been talking about all morning. That undivided heart. And I know Pastor Steve's got the series King and Kingdom, which was fantastic. If you haven't heard King and Kingdom, it's out there on the USBs. Get it. And yeah, we affect the kingdom everywhere we have influence. But the kingdom originates right here in the heart. It's a matter of the heart. Neither shall they say, lo here or lo there, for behold, the kingdom of God is within you. Luke 17, 22. And he said unto the disciples, the days will come when you shall desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man, and ye shall not see it. And they shall say unto you, see here or see there. Go not after them nor follow them. If there's an outpouring, let's just use Freeport for an example. It takes faith, but maybe Freeport. If there's an outpouring in Freeport, I'm not going to say that it would be wrong for us to go over and take part in that. But the Bible's telling us in these days that we're entering into, you're going to hear, it's over here, it's over there. The Lord is here, the Son of Man is here, it's over there. It says, follow not after them. When I was in Kenya, the second week we were in uh, this, uh, the place was called Sony Sugar, doesn't matter, there's a history, but 
Um, my phone started blowing up one night. And not WhatsApp, which I use for international stuff, but just my regular text messaging. I'm getting text after text after text after text. And the internet where we were at was kind of, kind of bad. And um, so it wasn't coming through with the text. It was just coming through, and I had to download it. And I didn't have consistent enough or fast enough or anything. I couldn't get it downloaded. So I just shelved it. And then on the way home, I forget if it was Nairobi or in Doha, Qatar, somewhere I hooked on to airport internet. And I started downloading these, there had to be 12 or 15 texts. And I'm still on a chat group with the group I went to Anchorage, Alaska with two years ago. And one of the members of that group was going to Asbury. And everybody's like, oh, ooh, oh you're so fortunate, you're so blessed, Tom. And it just, like, this is the greatest thing. Did I not read? Do you not go after them? Nor follow them. Now, am I saying that Asbury wasn't the real thing? No, I'm sure it was. But chasing around isn't going to do anything but feed yourself. You want an experience. I know too many Christians that are professional conference goers. Like they can't, they can't get satisfied. They ain't got no satisfaction in a Sunday church. I ain't going to the local body. I'm going to the big one where so-and-so's at. And then when we're done there, we're going over here. If I could make a judgment, hmm, they're no earthly good. Because just back while I was talking about that Mac Hammond book, you want to prosper? Plug in. Plug in. It's a matter of the heart. It's a matter of the heart. Verse 24, for as the lightning that lighteneth out of the one part under heaven shineth unto the other part under heaven, so shall also the Son of Man be in his day. But first must he suffer many things and be rejected of this generation. You just read that through real quickly. You're thinking, oh yeah, Jesus came, he ministered for, 33, or for three years, three and a half years, and yeah, he suffered. And then he went to the cross. But I think it's deeper than that. I think it's more inclusive than that. Are things getting tougher here? That was kind of weak, but I'll, I'll, I'll take it. Is Jesus being rejected here? Not here, but here in the world. This demonic thing that's going on which is going to soon be revealed, I believe is covered in this. Because Jesus is alive and he's being persecuted. So it says, but first he must suffer many things and be rejected of this generation. He was rejected of that generation. Now he needs to be, or he's going to be rejected from this generation. I believe this is for current events. And then a little reminder here in verse 26. And as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man. We're entering into the son, days of the Son of Man. They did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage. Until that day that Noah entered into the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Life went on as normal. We can say that for ourselves and some... I'm not going to say some of us. I'm going to say some not only ate and drank and married and were given in marriage. They locked themselves in their house. They wore a diaper on their face. They went and got a mandated procedure that I don't know what they call it. I didn't say anything. Great Awakening. Not being woke, but the Great Awakening. Wake up. Yes. 
The Spirit's saying, wake up, look at the signs. I believe it's in Matthew, he says, you can tell when it's going to rain. Yeah. Why can't you tell the signs of the times? We are in those days, brothers and sisters, we're in those days. Likewise, also, as it was in the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built it. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even thus shall it be in the days when the Son of Man is revealed. We're in that day. It's being revealed. Great awakening. And in that day, he which shall be upon the housetop and his stuff in the house, let him not come down to take it away. And he that is in the field, let him likewise not return back. And I put a note in there for myself. Where's your heart? You going to turn back and get your stuff? You going to run out to the garage and make sure your things are in order? At the Lord's return, we better be ready. Amen. And if we're eating and drinking and being merry and being married and going on and on and on and on and not paying any attention to the signs and letting our heart be divided with the stuff that we're doing now, we could miss it. We could miss it. I love you guys too much. I want to all go together. Whatever that looks like. Am I preaching rapture? Not necessarily. And this definitely didn't do it in six minutes. But it says, if we read on, well, I'm not quite there yet. I asked where your heart was. Luke 32. Remember Lot's wife. Why did she turn back? Was she just interested to see what fire and brimstone looked like? I don't think so. I think her heart was in Sodom. She might have got to go with her man because they were covenant partners, but I don't think her heart was there. That's why she looked back. And if you don't know the rest of the story, look it up. Whosoever shall seek to save his life shall lose it, and whosoever shall lose his life shall preserve it. Where is your heart? Is it surrendered to God? That's the question. Now, Luke 17, 34 to 37, I'm not going to read it. I <laughs> tripped you up, Hope. <laughs> that's all right. Because that does, that's, those are the scriptures that a lot of people base rapture theories on. And I, I, I'm not even going there. I'm not saying what I believe. Uh, you've heard some of it from this pulpit. And I'm not in, I want to get to this last part that God put on my heart in four minutes. And it's something that has been a constant word in this church, in this body. The Lord used me one day to say pretty much this. Ryan talked about it this morning. Josiah talked about it. <laughs> Isaiah 41.10 Fear thou not. I'll just let you think on that for just a minute. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee, yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Fear thou not. We know that the Bible tells us 365 times to fear not. I remember the day that Steve called me out of that seat right back there and said, Pastor Craig, you got a word for us. And I'm looking like I do. <laughs> and I came up and the Lord spoke, fear not. And it's been said many times. This isn't an original thought, but it's like the exhortation to forgive. It's a now word. It's a now word. Fear not. But I did do a little looking at this right hand of my righteousness because our, our grace group is studying the awesomeness of God and just how to reverence and fear God because I want to do it more and more and more and more. And everybody I'm associated with, I want them to do it with me more and more and more and more. But I looked up in Isaiah 40 and 12. 
Hmm. It's either 40 and 12 or 41. Where's 40, 12? You got 40, 12? Ah, thank you, because I can't find it. Who hath measured the waters in the hollow of his hand? He's with us with his hand. Don't think hand. It says he measures the waters. He doesn't say he measures the water by dipping his hand. He holds the waters of the universe in his hand. Can you picture that? That's the God we serve. In the hollow of his hand, that's right here. Nothing's spilling out. All the waters of every ocean, all the waters of every river, all the waters that are under the earth, all the waters that are above the earth, our God holds them in his hand. If that doesn't give you a picture of God, I don't know what to say. And then he goes on. Oh, it's up here. And meted out heaven, meted is measured, meted out heaven with the span. This is the span. He didn't say he used the span to measure the heavens. He said he measured the heavens with a span. That's our God. That's the God we serve. That's the God that lives within us. Jesus said, I am in the Father, and the Father is me in me, just as I, you are, I am in you, and you are in me. The Father's in us. We also studied it. I mean, give me two minutes, three, maybe, four? Two, three, five, four, nine. Three, three. <laughs> I'll, I'll be quick. We also studied in a grace group when he pours out his glory, it talks about the sun going dark. I shared this yesterday, but I, I think it fits. I always thought like the sun at some point, like a light switch is gonna go off. Anybody think that? You don't have to show your hands, but I'll bet you somebody's not. No, when the glory of God comes, it is gonna be so brilliant and so bright it's like if we were here at midnight, curtains pulled, blocked out those windows so we don't get any street light, turned out the lights, and I had this little pen light flashlight in total darkness. It would appear really quite bright, correct? But if I had that same little pen light flashlight right here under these spotlights and these house lights, it's gonna like, is that on? Right? I saw the other night when we were studying I really believe it's the Holy Spirit giving me a revelation. When the glory of God comes, the brilliance of the glory of God is going to make the sun appear as though it was dark. Just overwhelmed by the glory of God. And why do I say that? Because that glory is in you. That glory is in me. Why don't we live the life God has wanted us to live? That's just something to think about. Say la. So, I want to finish here. There's three verses. So I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Verse 11. Behold, all they that were incensed against thee shall be ashamed and confounded. They shall be as nothing, and they that strive with thee shall perish. This is a prophetic utterance from Isaiah. He's telling us of days to come, things to come. Anybody got anybody or anything contending with you? It's going to come to nothing. Now, you don't have to be a scholar to figure out what nothing means. Just separate the two words. It's a compound word. No thing. No thing. No thing will come against you. Kind of ties in with that fear not, doesn't it? And they that strive with thee shall perish. Verse 12, thou shalt seek them, those that contend with you, and shall not find them. 
because they're like no thing. When I was thinking about this, I, I don't watch many movies, but I've seen enough previews and trailers and stuff to know that some of the sci-fi stuff, they, they use the ray guns and you know, and there's always a pile of ashes or a little bit of smoke, yeah. right? Yeah. Am I right? Yeah. Okay, okay, because I don't watch movies, so I'm just kind of guessing. This says no thing. <laughs> no pile of ash, no smoke rising. Your enemies are going to be gone. Amen. Gone. Thou shalt seek them and shall not find them. Even them that contended with thee, they that war against thee shall be as nothing and as a thing of naught. Naught is the same as nothing. No thing, as though it never were. And verse 13, I'm going to close with. For I, the Lord thy God, will hold thy right hand, saying unto thee, Fear not, I will help thee. Tabitha, would you help me? Yes. Come up here, please. Give me your hand. Okay, thank you. You did that very well. Now, <laughs> you can go back to your seat. Okay. <laughs> you see what I did? Right hand. Right hand. I helped her. God's right hand. <laughs> Holding all the water of the world in the hollow of his hand. God's right hand that measured, measured, not measures, measured one time the heavens. He's going to hold you by the hand. Fear not. Fear not. Yes, I agree. Love, love is a big deal. Love is a part of it. Love is all of it. God is love. But he's telling us in this day and age so many different ways. Fear not. Fear not. <clears throat> I'm not the authority in the house on end times and what's going on now. Um, but I got a pretty good handle on it. And I'm not going to predict anything. But let me put it this way. I'm being extra aware in the days and weeks to come. Because whatever all this is going on, and you've got to realize that all of this, this, this enemy, this is a continued battle from the Garden of Eden that we're seeing worldwide. There's contention. There's all kinds of problems. There's, there's lying. There's deceit. There's... I'm not going into the whole thing. But it's going to come to a head. Now, the thought is, is that God bringing it all to a head? No, it's part of a plan. God's plan is much bigger than bringing down the cabal, if I can use that word. It's not limited to that, but that is a big part of it. And I believe we're going to see some major steps in this chess game that's being played in the very, very, very near future. So my exhortation to you, brothers and sisters, is get your heart right. It may be a relationship. It may be. Maybe you've got a chronic Ill situation in your body, a chronic illness that's contending with you. What did we read about those that contend with us? I don't think it's limited to people. I encourage you to get it dealt with. Get it dealt with once and for all. Stand on the word and go forward in the days and weeks and months to come so solid that the enemy is going to run the opposite way when he sees you. Amen? Amen. Okay, thank you. Stand up. I would like to bless you. Please receive the blessing that the Father has for you. He calls you beloved, the ones that are greatly loved. And we, he and I both desire that you experience prosperity 
and his type of divine health. And the way this happens is by allowing your soul to prosper through intimacy with him and knowledge of his word. I love you and I'll see you again soon.